All right, Psalm 4, and um, as the past few psalms have been, we just got started in this, uh, in this book, uh, but we've, we've noticed how packed with doctrine these psalms have been, even though there's just a few verses, this psalm is really no different. Um, the, the main theme we're going to be, kind of what this psalm is about and what it's focusing on is um, just again, you know, calling on God and being righteous and, you know, trusting in God with those that are against those that are wicked and um, just being able to rely on the Lord. Uh, it's, it's a very simple message overall, but we're going to kind of dig into this a little bit and just examine each verse and, and, uh, and see what we could learn and apply it with, with other passages in the Bible as well. So let's, let's start off right here in verse number one. The Bible says, Hear me when I call. O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Verse 2, hear, oh, excuse me, O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing Selah? Now, I'm going to focus in on the second verse a little bit, and when we get to the third, I'm going to tie it together with the first. But um, in verse number two, we see here, you know, he says the sons of men. This is not talking about believers. This is talking about unbelievers. This is talking about the unbelieving world, just the sons of men. You know, when we're born again, we become a son of God. And, you know, this, this applies perfectly with Genesis chapter six, when it says that the, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair to look upon. And people want to change this. Oh, yeah, the angels, you know, bred with humans. And then you got these hybrid giants. And that's the serpent seed. And that's all this other nonsense. You know, and, and really, it's just, it's foolishness is what it is. And, um, and I'm not going to get into all of that. But basically, we're seeing the same verbiage here. The, the daughters of men is just like it's saying here, O ye sons of men. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? Now, talking about turning my glory into shame. Well, that, the reason why he's saying that is because the things that are glorious to God, the things that would be considered a glory, the things that God would say, hey, good job, well done, you're doing great. You're, you know, you're going to be deserving of having glory or having honor based on the work that you're doing for the Lord. The world looks at that as just foolishness. The world will look down on that and do despite unto you for that and, and cast your name out as evil because of what you do. Something that ought to be a glory, something that ought to be honorable is looked down upon by the world as just, you know, that would be foolishness. You know, the Bible says that the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. So the things that we trust in in God's word, the world looks at that as just being completely foolish. They look at, oh, those dumb Christians, you know, they believe in creation and they, you know, they've got this, this God that's an, an angry God and all this other stuff and these people that hate God that think they're so smart, they profess themselves to be wise and they become fools and they are truly the foolish ones. But these are the same people as it's talking about that it says, oh, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? They're trying to make you feel ashamed for something that you ought to be able to glory over. Make you feel ashamed for going out and preaching the gospel. Make you feel ashamed for trusting in and reading the Bible every day and using this old book, you know, written by old men thousands of years ago that didn't even have plumbing. You know, the, the, whatever all these stupid comments are that you hear about the Bible, Yes, we do, we do trust in this book. Yes, we do believe this is God's word. Yes, I am going to look to this for every question that I have in this life and how I'm going to lead my life. Yes, this is my guidance. But they're going to want to make you be ashamed of this book. They're going to want to pull out pieces and try to make, oh, do you really believe this? Oh, do you really believe that? Yeah, I do. I do. I believe it all. And you know, I'm not going to be ashamed because I know that this is God's word. But... That's the way that they think. That's the way these sons of men will think. How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity? And see, when you, don't, when you don't believe in God's word, when you don't trust in the Bible, when you don't see the wisdom that's here, everything else is just vanity. 
What is the focus or the center of people's lives that aren't trying to live their life according to what the Bible instructs? It's vanity. It's meaningless. Because what do people do that, that aren't living in accordance with God's word? They're living for pleasures, worldly pleasures. They're living for monetary gain. They're living to, you know, it just increase their wealth in this world. That is what the unbelieving world does. It's whatever they hold as valuable would be like the money of this world. Making themselves feel good through drinking and drugs and whatever, whatever it is that, that's going to make them just feel good and indulge themselves in is what they're looking for. And the Bible calls that vanity because vanity is meaningless. It's worthless. It has no value whatsoever. It's just a, a fake. It's a fraud. It's a facade. It's something that is going to make you think, oh, wow, yeah, this is, this is really important. This is what I need to be spending my life on. And it's, and it's gone. I mean, even the riches of this world, it's all going to be burned up and come to nothing. It is meaningless. How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Now, that leasing, that word is an older word. It's not, it's not really used at all today unless you're talking about like you have a lease, you're leasing an apartment or something like that. That's obviously not what this word is talking about. But basically what the word leasing is here, it's something that's just dishonesty or lying. That is what this word leasing means here. Is that you're seeking after leasing, after you know, dishonesty off of things that just aren't true. You, know, you, you love the things that are vanity and you're just seeking after things that are just a lie. And that is what your focus is on. And the people that are into that stuff, they're going to be trying to take your glory and turn it into a shame. But don't let them get to you. Don't let them bring you down into, into coveting their vanity and their worthlessness and their lying, their deceits that they want to trust in, their leasing. And what I, what, one of the things that came to my mind as I was preparing for the sermon is when, when you see this, that the, the sons of men that will turn you know, our glory into shame was uh, the, the phrase that, that comes up frequently, it seems like online, you know, the truth is hate to those that hate the truth, right? Those people that, that hate God's word, those people that hate the truth of the Bible, they're going to call that hate. They're going to say, oh, that's hate speech. Oh, I can't, you know, God's word, the Bible, you can't even say some of the, you know, these verses out loud because now you're a big hater. They hate the truth. That's why they call the truth hate. The Bible says, has a verse for this in Isaiah chapter 5. You don't have to turn there, but please turn if you would to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 20, the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. They basically swap things. The things that are evil, hey, they're calling those things good. The things that are good, they're calling those things evil. The things that we should be able to glory about, in, in doing the work of the Lord, they're going to say that's a shame. The things that they ought to be shame about is their glory. The Bible says that the you know, wicked people in Romans 1, that they, they glory in their own shame. People that live in lasciviousness and have adulterous hearts and adulterous attitudes and, and, and fornicating filthiness, People are glorying in that. They think that's, oh, wow, look at me. They, they think that there's nothing wrong with it. And it's something that they ought to be ashamed about. And they ought to be just, just in tears over. Instead, they glory over it. And that is pure wickedness. That is evil and wicked. And the Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. These are people who don't seek God's wisdom, that do despite to the word of the Lord, that don't care what the Bible says. They don't want the instruction. They're wise in their own eyes. They think they know better. I had you turn to 1 John chapter 2. Because the things that are glorious in God's eyes are a shame in the world's eyes and vice versa. God and the world are diametrically opposed. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
Things that are in the world are vanity, by the way. This is this, it, it goes completely, uh, ties in perfectly with Psalm 4. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I want you to let this verse sink down. This is a verse that could probably be preached week after week after week after week in this wicked and sinful generation that we live in today. People today want to put on a big show, it seems, in, in the fundamental Baptist churches. Look how holy I am. And they put up on display or on Facebook or wherever how great they are. And then come to find out, oftentimes, these people, actually, they don't love the Father at all. They'll proclaim they love God. They proclaim to this, oh, yeah, I love God. I love the Bible. I love Jesus Christ. And they love the world. And the love of the Father is not in them because they're in love with this world. They're in love with the crap on the TV screen and the garbage that comes out of the music, out of the radio. They love the things that this world puts out and they want to have nothing to do with the things of God in their heart. But oftentimes, outwardly, yeah, they'll put on the show. But in their heart, they're wicked as hell. And they do not have the love of the Father in them. But they want to pretend like they do. The Bible says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We live in too lusty of a culture. And people are lusting after other people, having adulterous, lusty type of, of attitudes towards other people and, and don't care about the hurt and the damage they do to other people. And, and look, I'm telling you, it's all wickedness. But it's worse than when the same people want to go and say, oh yeah, I love God. I'm a Christian. I love God. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's the determiner right there. You have to ask yourself, what do you love? What do I love? What are the things I really like? What do I enjoy? Where do I derive my pleasure from? If I claim to be a Christian, if I claim to love God, do I love God's words? Do I really love God's words? If someone asked me if I love God, I'm sure you would probably say yes, but test yourself. Are you in love with the world? Do you love all the things of the world? Love of the Father is not in you. In the Bible, the Bible doesn't draw a gray area. Did you ever notice that? Jesus said, if, if, if you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. He doesn't allow for this, well, you're kind of on board, you're kind of wishy-washy, but I, I still like all these other things in the world, but I kind of want, you know, there's no room for that. The Bible talks about the righteous and the wicked. The Bible talks about those that are gathering and those that are scattering. There isn't room for all this middle ground. And if we would be a little bit more critical of ourselves, I think it would do us well. Instead of just saying, well, you know, I know I do this and this and this and this and this, but overall, I think I'm pretty good. Well, you know what? Do you, are you loving the things of the world? Because if you are, then you're not loving God. And it's as simple as that. There's, there's no middle of the road. There's no middle ground there. Let's go back to Psalm 4. And we'll, we'll see this concept here, verse number three. Psalm four, verse number three, the Bible says, but know, what the, but know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now, this is not talking about salvation. When it's talking about a person being godly, that's not just saying, oh yeah, they're saved. Because living godly doesn't necessarily have anything to do with salvation. Living a godly, righteous life is something that you have to work. That's work. Someone who's considered godly is someone who's working. But notice, and I said we were going to go back to verse number one. In verse number one, he said, hear me when I call, O God. This is David calling out unto the Lord in need of God, which, hey, we all are. And if you think you're not in need of God, then you're proud and you don't know anything. 
Hear me when I call, O God. And then he ends verse 1 with, and hear my prayer. Hear me. God, God, I need you. Help me. Hear my prayer. And then in verse 3, he says, but know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. He has a special place for those that are walking godly. And when you're godly and you're set apart, the Bible says, and the Lord will hear when I call unto him. So he's calling unto God. He's like, God, hear me. But he already knows, hey, I'm living a godly life. I'm living righteously. I know that God's going to hear me because God has set me apart because that's who God is going to listen to. And if you want God to hear you in your times of trouble, if you want God to bless you, if there's something lacking in your life and it's been lacking for a long time and you want God to hear you and you want to plead and beg God, then you better make sure that you're walking godly. Say, I don't know why God's not blessing me in this area or in that area. Why am I not getting, I feel like I'm not getting any blessings from God. Are you godly? And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about this prosperity preaching of, you know, God giving you some mansion and, you know, millions of dollars or anything like that. I'm just talking about getting a, getting a blessing from God that, that would be something that, that God would give you. The Lord will hear when I call on him. It's the prayer of the righteous. If we want to get our prayers answered, if we really want to get in touch with God, if we want God to hear us, it is critical that we make sure that we are walking godly, that we are walking righteousness. That's why the Bible says in James chapter 5 that the, um, it says in verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. You know, pray for each other. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of Someone living in a bunch of sin avails much? No, wait, no, that's not what it says. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Why? Because God has a special place for the righteous man. God's going to listen to the righteous man. You know why God's going to listen to the righteous man? Because the righteous man, in order to be doing righteously, is listening to God. Because he's already opened up his ears first and foremost to what God has to say to him. And if we want God to hear us, and hear me when I cry. And hear me when I have my problems. And hear me when it seems like everyone's coming against me. And hear me during the worst times. We better have already been listening to him. And listening doesn't mean in one ear and out the other. Listening doesn't mean understanding something and then not doing anything about it. Listening is hearing and applying and living godly. And then, you know what avails much? The almighty God that is able to, to do all kinds of things in this life and to answer prayer, he's there for us because he knows that you're already listening and he loves you for that. And he's going to listen to you. Proverbs chapter 15. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 15. There's a couple places I want to look at here in Proverbs 15. We're going to see some more scriptural evidence of how important it is to be praying righteously as, as someone who's walking in a godly way and not just involved in all, all manner of sin. Proverbs 15, verse number 8. The Bible says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Think about that. The sacrifice of the wicked. So who's the wicked? Someone who's not godly, right? You're not walking godly, you're walking wickedly. You're in wicked sin, but yet you want to make this sacrifice to God, right? You're still living wickedly. You're still doing the things that are wicked in the sight of God or abominable and things that God hates. But, oh, you're going to bring in your great sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice my time and show up to the church. I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to do that for God. You know what? God looks at that. He says, oh, you're going, to make a, you're going to make a sacrifice to me and you're not even listening to me and you're just living wickedly. He says, that's an abomination in my sight. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. That makes God happy. 
when the upright, the person who's walking godly, prays to God and talks to God and asks God for things. He actually enjoys that. That's a delight to the Lord. And guess what? If God likes it and it's a delight, you better believe he's going to hear us and he'll answer you. Verse number nine, the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Jump down to verse number 26. Again, the, the, the comparison. And, and again, no middle ground. So about wicked, righteous. Not a scale, wicked, righteous. Verse number 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. You want to know how to be righteous? You study to answer. You study God's word. You study to know the truth. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Judge your righteousness or wickedness by what comes out of your mouth. You want to do another self-test? What are the things that you're talking about? You're talking about the things of the world, guess what? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And we already saw that, that the, if you love the things of the world, you don't have the love of the Father. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Verse number 29. Look at verse number 29. The Lord is far from the wicked. He's far. But he heareth the prayer of the righteous. This is how we get God to hear our prayers. And you know what? David knew this. David knew this when he was penning down Psalm 4. That's why he said first he's calling unto God, God, hear me. But he already knew he's going to hear him because David was walking godly when he was penning down that psalm and, and calling out unto God. And he's basically saying, well, I know you hear me. Proverbs 28, flip over to Proverbs 28. We're going to see in, in Proverbs 28 the same thing. Verse number 9. Proverbs 28, verse number 9, the Bible says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, you don't want to hear God's laws. You don't want to hear your sin. You don't want to hear that stuff preached again. You don't want to hear it from God's word. Even his prayer shall be abomination. When you don't want to listen to God and you don't want to listen to his word, you know what abomination is? God hates it. We already saw that, that it's his delight for the righteous to pray in him, to, to hear the prayers of the righteous. That, that makes God happy. As much as that makes God happy, God hates to hear the person going to him that does, doesn't want to actually hear from him. People do this all the time. All the time. They don't want to hear the instruction. They don't want to hear Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't. They don't want to hear the rules. They don't want to hear God's law. But then when they get into trouble because they got into that sin, what do they want to do? They want to go to God and have God fix everything. I can see why it makes God angry. I can see why it's an abomination. He's like, look, I've been trying to tell you how not to get in that situation. And now you're coming to me asking me for help. If you would have just listened to me the first time, none of that would have even happened. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to see the con in, in the context of this passage in Isaiah chapter 1. This is, this is um, a passage that's being given to like Judah and Jerusalem. And this is during the days of Isaiah, which is, you know, we just went through First and Second Kings. And we remember there were some godly kings and there was Hezekiah and, his, you know, and, and all these people. And, and I kind of covered this a little bit during that series, but um, there was a succession of, of pretty good kings and it seemed like things were going really well. But then we see in Isaiah chapter 1 that like the heart of the people, even though you had these righteous kings, the heart of the people was still really wicked. 
And in Isaiah chapter 1, in a context, he's basically likening Judah and Jerusalem unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, he, he's, he's saying, it basically before, because I'm going to start reading verse number 13, but he's basically saying, you know, except there has been a remnant here, except there was a small number of people who actually still had respect unto God's word and, and were serving the Lord, we would have just been completely annihilated like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how bad things were in this time frame. And, um, you know, the people become wicked. They turn into a people that simply claims the Lord with their lips, but their heart is completely turned away from them. They're the people that, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, I love God. And they just love the things of the world, and they're loving whatever, and they're in their wickedness, and they don't really care. They don't want to hear the word of the Lord, and their prayer becomes abomination. That is the state of Israel or the state of Judah in this passage. So, again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the backdrop to this, but it's relevant to what we're covering in Psalm chapter 4 because it's this same concept because this concept comes up multiple times throughout Scripture on, on the righteous' prayers and the wickedness and how much God hates the wicked, you know, all this stuff. So let's look at verse number 13. We'll see a little bit more here, get a little bit more truth from the Bible. Verse number 13, bring no more vain oblations. Oblations, you know, it's a sacrifice. So he's talking about the sacrifice of the wicked. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. So all these things that they were supposed to be doing in observance of the Lord, he's saying all of those things that they're doing is an abomination to him. He's saying, I can't even away with it. It's sin, it's iniquity. Why? Because they're just going through the motions and their heart isn't in it at all. Because what God really wants is your heart in it. More than just going through the motions and pretending to be some Christian, he actually wants you believing it and doing it. And when you're not doing it and you just go through the motions and you put on this big front and you're a big stinking hypocrite, God hates that. And you know, we need to keep this in mind too because the, the hypocrisy, I don't know about you, I, I've run into so many people out soul winning and so many people I've met even personally, the reason why they don't go to church anymore is because of something that happened at church because Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, they had all, you know, they were so good and godly and then they come to find out they had all this wickedness and all this stuff going on and they look at you know, if someone like this was just a total complete fraud that I don't want to have anything to do with this stuff. Now, I'm not saying that that attitude's right because one person fails or because someone screws it up just for everything to never go to church again, but let's face it, it happens. It does happen, and all the more reason why we need to take heed, we need to take heed to ourselves so that we're not getting into this whole thing of, of getting, letting our hearts slip away from God and get into all kinds of wickedness and keeping this front up like, oh, we're so righteous. And God ends up just, just hating us because of what we become. Verse number 14, Isaiah 1 says, Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. It hates it. I hate it when you go through the motions. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands... This is talking about in prayer. They spread forth their hands. I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. He's saying, you're so wicked. You're like, you're, you're murderous and your hands have blood on them and you're going to lift up your hands to me like that? And you expect me to hear you? And expect me to help you out? Verse number 16, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Again, this isn't talking about salvation because that's not how a person gets saved. A person isn't saved by, getting, by repenting of their sins. A person saved by believing, putting their faith in the Lord. He's, he's talking to people though. I mean, in the context, he's talking to his, his people, right? It's symbolic of, People, you know, we know all of Israel wasn't saved, but he's saying, hey, you know, get rid of this garbage, clean up your act, and then I'll listen to you. And God will, because God's a merciful God. 
Thank God he's a merciful God. So when we do, if we do, or when we do, screw up and, and get turned around like these people did, he's saying, look, just get back right with me and come back to me. And I'll listen to you again. But you got to clean things up and straighten them up. Cease to do this evil. Learn to do well, verse 17. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. That is the path. We do those things. That is righteousness. That it would be living godly. Again, more examples. of What does it mean to live godly? What does it mean to be righteous? Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Seek God's law. Seek the answers here. Receive the instruction. Relieve the oppressed. Help people out. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. That's living a godly life. And you know what? When you're doing those things and you have that humble attitude and you care about other people more than yourself, and you're not so focused in on yourself and all the things that you don't have and, and getting involved in all the wickedness and all the things, they're going to make you feel good because you're so focused on yourself and you become so selfish that you don't care about anyone else and you become wicked. It's time to change that, that attitude and focus on everyone else. Plead for the fatherless and the widows and the people that don't have anyone to stick up for them and care more about them and learn to do well and seek judgment. That's going to get you on the right path and that's going to get you in good favor with God and that's where God's going to set you apart and be like, I have a special place for this person over here and when they call, guess what? I'm going to hear them because I've set them over here. This is like my priority list. Turn through to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter number three. As we go through the book of Psalms, we're going to hit various aspects of prayer because there are a lot of prayers. There's a lot of, you know, God, hear me when I call. I'm praying to you. David, you know, has faced in his life and other psalmists too. But, but David primarily, he had a lot of, of conflict in his life. He had a lot of problems. He had people coming after him, people trying to kill him. So, of course, there's going to, it's going to be reflected in, in the Psalms and the book that he penned down, his prayers to God. One aspect of your prayer life should be, hey, if I want God to listen to me, I better make sure I'm listening to him and living a godly life. If I'm asking for certain things in my life, I better be listening. Because why would God answer, answer you if you already aren't listening? Why would he think you're going to listen to him again? And, and it doesn't make any sense. So Malachi chapter 3. I'm almost done with this point here. Malachi chapter 3. Verse number 14, the Bible says, Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Now, I didn't have this in my notes, but this, this, this actually ties in perfectly with, um, with Psalm 4, verse 6, where the Bible says, There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. So in verse 14, you're saying, well, what's the profit? What's in it for me? What is it profit that we keep his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? That's that attitude, and, it, and it's a similar attitude in, in verse number six that says, well, who's going to show us any good? What good is it to serve God? But we're going to get to that. I'm going to expound a little bit more on that verse in just a minute here. I want to keep going through uh, Malachi here. Look at verse number 15. And now we call the proud happy. That's fitting. <laughs> we call the, the proud sodomites gay today. Now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. They're exalted. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And listen, look at this. So this is the time he's describing in Malachi 3. Oh, what profit is it to keep these ordinances? And they're calling the proud happy and wicked people are being lifted up. Then in, in verse number 16, though, it talks about those that fear God. During this time when you got all this wickedness going on and it's being exalted and everything else. Verse 16, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Let's not blow it. When God's willing to write a book of remembrance before him, because the people that actually fear him and are trying to live godly and do what's right are having problems and are talking one to another. 
This doesn't even say they're going to the Lord. They're talking off in one to another about all these problems and all this wickedness, all this other stuff that's going on. Hey, God's paying attention to all that stuff and he's going to take care of it because they're living godly, because they fear the Lord. What, I mean, how awesome is that to think, hey, if I live godly, God's going to be paying attention to me really closely and the wrongs that are done and the people that are coming after me or whatever, he already knows about it. He cares. And he can deliver me. And I don't need to worry about being saved from anybody or anything. Because if I'm just fearing God, everything else will work itself out. And it's actually a pretty good comfort and solace to know that. It's, it's just as comforting as knowing that, hey, I know that no matter what I do, I'm going to heaven when I die. That is a very comforting thought. It's very comforting and very reassuring to know that heaven's my home. And I can't lose that. But it's also very comforting to know that if I then choose to walk godly, I really have nothing to worry about in this world and in the next world. We already got the next world covered, but in this world, I got nothing to worry about. God's paying attention in heaven. Verse number 17 there, Malachi 3, And they shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern look at this, between the righteous and the wicked. Righteous, wicked. Not anyone in between. He said, you're, able to discern, you're going to be able to discern and tell the difference between the righteous and the wicked. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. You're either serving God or you're not. There, there is no kind of maybe sort of halfway in the middle. Sorry, that's, I, show me that in the scripture. Let's go back to Psalm 4. Psalm 4, verse number 4. The Bible says, stand in awe. God is, is awesome. We, we ought to be awed by who God is and be able to stand in awe of God. He says, and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. This is how we ought to walk. This is how we ought to walk daily. This is what's being put forward as how God hears us, who God is listening to, this attitude. Not offering up, you're, you're not offering up the sacrifices of the wicked because you're just walking wickedly and you're just trying to give some sacrifice to God to like, you know, to pay for your indulgences like the Catholic Church likes to do, right? Go out and live like hell and then bring in some money and give it to the priest and that's supposed to absolve you of your sins. I don't think so. God looks at that as being abominable. But when you're righteous and then you offer up the sacrifice of righteousness, put your, put your trust in the Lord. That's how you can be confident and, and just know that God's going to hear us. Verse number six there in Psalm four, the Bible says, there be many that say, who will show us any good? And I reference this already. Who's going to show us any good? And there's many people that say this. Many people have this attitude. Who will show us any good? And he answers, Lord, lift thou up, thy, up the light of thy countenance upon us. You know, basically, God, shine on us and show us that, you know, God will show us good. Who's going to show us any good? God will. We're warned repeatedly in Scripture that we're in a spiritual battle, that there's a fight going on that we need to be ready. We need to have our armor on. That, you know, yea, all live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's going to be troubles. There's going to be trials. There's going to have all these problems, right? There's going to be all these problems in this life. But this does not mean, even we're given this warning to help prepare us, right? So that, so that when something does come, we're not just completely just knocked on our back and don't know what to do because, oh man, I can't believe that ever happened. We're warned. We're given the warnings to be in preparation. But don't be deceived think, into thinking that because we receive all these warnings that 
this whole life just means everyone's just going to be against us all the time and no one's going to do any good for you ever your whole life because of this. And, and have this attitude of many will say, you know, who's going to show us any good? Because God will show us good. Because God's here to deliver us. The, the, our entire life isn't just going to be just total, you know, unending persecution at all times. It's not. Even when you're living godly, that's the God's not going to, you know, God wants us to be able to have the joy. God will give us some blessings, but um, we, we have to be prepared for the battles. We have to be prepared for the fight. But let's not get so focused in on, on these things that could happen to say, well, who's going to show us any good at all? And then start to think, well, why should I even bother? Because my whole life is just going to be some big wreck. I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. And it won't be. Verse number seven. Now it says, thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. The joy that we can receive, the gladness from trusting in the Lord surpasses the joy of an increase of physical wealth. Because that's what he's comparing it to. He says, you know, when you gave them their corn and their wine, however happy they were with, oh man, we got a big yield this year. Wow, we really did well financially. Wow, everything is going great, right? You feel joyful about that. Everyone does. I mean, I feel joyful when I have a good year financially and things get become a little bit easier and less stressful in certain areas because, of, you know, because of finances or whatever. But you're going to find more joy and more gladness in your heart by being godly and being able to trust in God. And... and realizing that even that, you know, the increase of the corn and the wine, that's still just vanity. It really is vanity. It's this, this temporary satisfaction that is fleeting and gone in a moment. And I'm just being real. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here going to stand up and lie and be like, oh yeah, I don't get happy when, you know, when, when I increase financially. No, of course I do. But just remember that, that that, whatever that is, however much money you make in a year is just going to be gone anyway. So who really, I mean, really, does it matter? No. No, it doesn't. Because the things that really matter are eternal. And, and the things that are temporal don't really matter. Philippians chapter 3, you don't have to turn, you can just stay in Psalm 4. Philippians 3 verse 1, the Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's where we rejoice. That's what brings us our joy, our trust, our confidence, reliance on Jesus, relying on him, knowing, as David know, knew in this psalm, knowing, hey, when I call on God, he's going to hear me. He's there for me. It's more comforting to know if I were to lose my job, if I were to have, you know, go through some, some serious financial trouble, it's more comforting to know that, hey, if I'm, if I'm living godly, then I know that we're taken care of and I know that God's going to hear me. That is more comforting than, say, having a six-month supply of food and money and everything else just banked up to try to hedge against these problems. And look, there's nothing wrong with having that, but it's so much more, it gives me so much more confidence to know that, hey, if God's hearing me, it doesn't matter if I don't have all this other stuff straight now. It doesn't, you know, it, I, could, I, could, I don't have to have this huge nest egg to be, to be knowing that things will be just fine. I'm not saying you can't have the nest. I'm not saying that's evil or wicked or anything like that. I'm saying it's wise, but... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more confident just knowing, hey, I'm doing what's right. 
I'm walking godly, and then, then God, God's there for me. He's going to hear me. He's my defense. He's my shield. He's my buckler. He's all these things. Material goods can be there or not. doesn't matter. It's definitely a joy in knowing we have an all-powerful Father in heaven looking after us. Verse number eight there in Psalm four says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. And that's when you know, when, you, you know, when you're stressed out, when you're worried about things, you don't, you don't get good sleep, do you? You're, you're troubled, you're, you're concerned, you're fretting, you're worried about things. But the trust that we could have in the Lord and the confidence that we could have is, I'm gonna lay me down in peace and sleep. I'm gonna sleep well. I'm gonna sleep well tonight because... What am I going to worry about? Am I going to worry about someone breaking into my house and, and stealing my kids or killing me or stealing all my stuff? No. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to worry about, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm doing everything I need to be doing, I'm not going to worry about these things. I'm going to lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. You could have all the guns and locks and whatever in the world and not be safe at all. Or you could have none of those things and be completely safe because safety is of the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31 says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. God's the one that ultimately can keep you safe. And it's interesting too, you know, I've... Uh, of the various documentaries and things that I've seen about, you know, crime, you know, crime stories and, and people that get murdered or whatever. You can have everything going for you. And people do oftentimes. They've got a lot of money. They've got, they have security guard. They have all this stuff. And someone can walk up right behind them and just <laughs> shoot them right in the head. And all those safety measures and everything else that they had did nothing. Did nothing to save them. But then the guy that's got none of those advances, none of those, you know, secure, you know, none of those security systems on their home and cameras and everything else, and they're doing what's right, can go through the most dangerous ghettos and walk through unscathed. I just recently had a conversation about that with, um, we were planning on going to, to Detroit for the, the soul winning marathon, the, not the soul winning marathon, the soul winning uh, conference. There's a soul winning conference. I don't, I don't even think I mentioned it in our announcements today. I should. I need to add that to the bulletin. There's a soul winning conference coming up in April, and it's going to be in Detroit. And of course, Detroit is, you know, has some crime and everything else. So, you know, I have family members that are concerned about me and my safety, but they're like, oh, are you, you know, like asking if I'm, are you, you going to be able to carry your gun there? And so I'm just like, look, it doesn't even matter. Like, I don't even care. I didn't even look at that because, to me, it doesn't even matter. Now, I wear, you know, I'm carrying a weapon, a firearm, almost all the time because I think it's prudent, but I'm not really trusting in that for my safety. It really, I'm not. And I'm definitely not trusting in that when I'm going out soul winning, I'll tell you that much. Because I know that when I'm serving the Lord and I'm walking in the Spirit and I know I'm doing what's right and I can say with a clear conscience, that yes, I am living godly. I'm not perfect. I'm not claiming to be, but, it, but there is a difference between living wickedly and living godly. And if I could say that, then what do I have to worry or fear about anything that anybody can do to me? I'm not going to worry about that. That's, that's silly. Safety's of the Lord. And if I'm doing the Lord's work, hey, I'm going <laughs> to... God can send his angels that this world can't see to keep my way safe before me. And I wholeheartedly believe that. And I believe that he does that. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction that you give us. Lord, I pray that you would stir up our hearts and help us to just reanalyze our life regularly and just and, and, and scrutinize ourselves and and, and decide, you know what, what, whatever, whatever area we're slipping in, because God, I know we're all slipping in some area of our life. Nobody has everything together perfectly. Help us to just, to, to, tonight, to just say, stop, I'm, I'm going to stop this. 
I'm not going to allow this sin to drag me down or get the better of me, dear Lord, but that we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to just turn into people who just put up a big Christian front, but inside we're just full of wickedness and rottenness, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to, to, to get that, to, to mortify the deeds of the flesh and to mortify the, 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 the wicked lusts of the flesh, dear Lord, and to, to revive and renew our spirit that's within us. Help us to walk in the spirit, dear God. Help us to do what's right so that way we know that when we call on you, we can have full confidence and assurance that you hear us. God, we love you. We love you in sincerity and truth, dear Lord. I pray that you would please bless everyone here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.